Hi, hi. I wanted to talk about subgrain and the necessity or the beauty of the necessity of imperfection. Um, it's a little windy out here. Hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, I just want to talk about, I don't know, imperfection. Um, so I wanted to show you guys this hide that um, um, this is a deer hide that I tanned this past winter, you know, fall winter season. Um, and it was actually, it was from the only deer, the one deer that I processed this cold season. And um, he was little, he was really little, like barely even full grown. Um, and actually like his fur was so thick and fluffy, almost, it, almost like a little reindeer that like had it been in better shape, had his body, his body been in better shape, he was a bit bloated. Um, I would have been tempted to tan it with the hair on because it was just so beautiful and adorable. Um, but I didn't, um, and the hide was so thin. It was such a small deer, and the hide itself was actually, I was shocked how thin, thin and delicate it was, even though, like, he was full grown, just not, like, he only had little nubs of horns coming out. So I was shocked by how thin the hide was. So, um, so I knew I couldn't do buckskin with it. I knew I would just end up tearing it, tearing too many holes in it to try to do buckskin. So I was like, okay, I'll just, you know, I'll vegetable tan it with the grain on, which is what I do most of the time. And I was like, oh, I'll get some nice, really super supple, thin, shiny, it'll be like goat skin leather. It'll be wonderful. Um, even though, like, this deer was roadkill and it kind of had you know, what people call road rash or what, you know, it had a lot of more areas of the hide than I originally realized. Um, had gotten a bit bruised on the road, so the grain on a few areas of the hide was like already a bit um, uh, cut up and shredded. And I didn't totally realize the extent of it after I'd already, so I'd already bucked the hide. I, I used wood ash, taken off the hair, but left the grain and was super careful like just barely taking off the hair and the epidermis because I um, you know I knew I did not want to scuff up this thin little hide and put it in tannin solution and you know after the first day or two or so in tannins you know I just kept taking it out and inspecting it and just really realized like okay you know this whole area of the grain is not so good looking and but also this area here and also this area here and I was just like, uh, this is just like gonna be a scrappy hide. Like, I don't want another hide that's like supposed to be a grain on hide, but that it's it's a mix, it's a mix and it's a mess. I just have so little use for hides like that. So it was one of those hides where I changed my mind halfway through the process, um, and I realized, okay, I gotta just take all the grain off. Like, it's just it's not good looking. I gotta just take it all off. Um, but any of you who ever have ever tried to take grain off after a hide has started to tan in tannins a bit, um, like after only a little while in tannins, the grain really, the grain tans and it um, really tightens to the skin a lot. So I, you know, got the hide back on my bean, a scrape, you know, all the rest of the grain off. And oh my gosh, like so difficult. Even though it's a thin little delicate hide, like oh my god, like took forever. And I got this t t silly tiny little beam. It's so thin here that like on deer it's pretty ridiculous because you know you have so little surface area on your scraping knife to actually like, it's just, it's so time consuming. It's a little bit ridiculous. So, you know, I've already put in too many hours into this hide than I should have. Um, put it back in the solution, you know, finish tanning it, um, vegetable tan style, and, uh, it 
tans quickly. It's so thin. It tans like in a week or two. And uh, soften it, and it's lovely. It softens easily. Um, but the thing is that, like, you know, try as I might, and I was working in, it was winter. I guess it was cold or something. So I was, like, working in this dungeon basement. So the lighting is poor. It's hard for me to even see the green. Um, so, you know, what ended up happening was that there's all this subgrain left on the hide. Um, and if you don't know what that is, it's just, you'll see it a lot on buckskin. You know, there's the grain layer, the shiny layer on the top of the skin. And when you take the grain off, you see just those soft core fibers underneath. But when you're, if you've bucked a hide to do buckskin or suede, and you're scraping off the grain, sometimes you notice there's almost like tissues that are kind of in between grain and the fibers underneath, and they get called subgrain. And uh, in buckskin, when people are doing buckskin like for sale, um, typically people try to get every little speck of the subgrain off. They just want a completely smooth, uniform, quote unquote, perfect surface to the buckskin. No imperfections, right? Um, so it's all about getting every little speck of subgrain off of there too. And I remember um, a friend of mine, I've mentioned Dennis Lanigan, who's an amazing tanner and um, super knowledgeable, super accomplished, super obsessive about tanning like I am, um, had worked for this tannery in New Mexico, like natural veg tan, um, leathers, and was like doing all the tanning um, of all the hides. And then came to the East Coast, we were talking, and he told me, how, like we were talking about subgrain, and he was telling me how he like scrapes each hide twice just for the bucking, like just to scrape the grain off, like would go over the whole hide twice to make sure that there was absolutely no speck of subgrain left. And at the time, I remember just thinking like, what? Like, why? Why would you do that? Who gives a shit? Uh, and then the same for membrane. So and then on the membrane side to try to get off like every single speck of membrane so that the buckskin is just completely uniform. And for me, I'm like, I never take off all the membrane. It's impossible. Like I love all the fuzzies fuzzies. Like the fuzzies, um, you can see like, you know, on buckskin, the membrane side, like all those fuzzies to me, I love. That's what gives it like nice soft texture. It's usually the side that I wear against my skin. And like, it doesn't affect the tanning of the skin to not get every single bit of that off. It, it just doesn't make a difference. Um, so, you know, to me, that's just a good illustrative story of, you know, like in our world now, or well, most industrialized cultures of the world now, um, all materials, all manufactured materials, uh, leather included, like even if it's real leather, um, certainly there's like tons of faux leather that's petroleum based and actually not from an animal. But even leather that is from an animal that's commercially tanned, um, you know, it's made to all come out uniform and identical and the same like the, the, the hides are thinned so that they're all the exact same thinness um, you know using really strong chemicals and stuff like that so that there's there's complete uniformity it's a product right there's 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 nothing left on that skin that that would cue you in to like oh wait a minute this this, this was an animal, and this was actually not just an animal, but an individual. You know, this was a particular cow, a particular goat, a particular deer who had a unique life, and it lived that life, um, and it had its own spirit and its own name. Um, and to me, like that's what natural tanning... To me, that's the whole point. To me, that's everything that it's about, in a way is you can't take away 
the individuality and the imperfection, which is proof of life in the skin. Um, so for example, like, you know, this, it, it's sewn into a bag. I made a little simple, simple gathering bag out of it. But you can see the skin, see it better in the sunlight. It's got all this color variation and texture variation from my scraping. And all of this, all the darker colors, uh, it's not grain, it's subgrain. And that comes out darker with the tannins, so there's texture differences, there is color change, and there's this amazing, amazing pattern. So this ended up just being like a bag, like a really super simple gathering bag. Oh, I wish you could see it better. But anyway, so for me, you know, like I am a perfectionist and I've been a perfectionist my whole life, you know, and it's something that I'm very aware of and that I work with. Um, so for me, like perfect imperfection is one of the great themes of my life. It's like one of the main reasons that I'm so wedded to, um, sorry, my nose itches. I'm so wedded to um, tattooing by hand, you know, because there's an imperfection that a machine can never imitate that the human hand can do. Yeah, and it's the same with, it's the same with tanning. Um, so even just here, like, oh, I tried to find a piece of buckskin that had little bits of subgrain or grain on it just so you can see and if you've ever tanned buckskin I'm sure you get that on here's a section of a piece of buckskin it's dyed with black walnut so it's darker you can see just like little streaks like that little bits little like this hide's got this nice area which is all these different speckles and marks they're like little bits of subgrain on there. Let's see, I had found another spot. Yeah, on this other spot right here. And there's a little bit of actually true grain on there. It's very shiny. Right? And then all the rest is like pretty uniform. Right? And so to me, like in a buckskin garment, like I love that. I want to see that. Like it just gives character. Like it's not too clean. Like you're like, this was a hide pulled from an animal, for God's sake. Like this was a bloody affair. This was real. Like there is, um, there's a spirit inside of this, right? Um, full of all the grief and all the pain and elements of death, as well as all the beauty. Um, Beauty beyond, <laughs> beauty beyond compare of that deer. You know, I know, like, it sounds silly, but like, the soul of the deer is, is, is apparent. It's obvious. I can smell, like, I can, like, I can smell it. I can feel it. I can see it. It's apparent. Um, and thank God for that, like, lack of complete control. Remember when I was in college, I was a visual artist and I was studying Dadaism and Surrealism for a little while. And, um, you know, a big part of that movement was, those two movements, was about uh, chance and the unconscious. And basically these artists and, and literary folks and um, bohemians, like, trying to f almost manufacture ways to not have control over their creations, whether it's paintings or writings or things like that. Um, so that there's an element of chance and mystery to the work. So things like automatic writing or collage, um, different manufactured, different ways to figure out how to, yeah, not, not have complete control over the creation, which we never ever have complete control over any creation ever. It's such a human illusion that that's even possible. Um, but still, you know, so that I, I really appreciated that at the time, studying that. I thought it was so great. Um, 
and wonderful and in another way totally stupid like stupid um, because the lack of control and the utter aliveness it's been in front of us all the all along all the fuck along for all of time on planet earth it's been right in front of us and you know like i see it in the deer um like it's in the animals right in front of us it's in the plants right in front of us and the wood and the stones and the sky that's in the water like it's a whole symphony of chaos and beauty and uh perfect order all mixed together at the same time like duh so yeah, i don't know just tanning 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 also wanted to show you um this other piece here so here's you know walnut dyed brown and then smoked undyed buckskin just a comparison there um so this is a hide back up back up back up back up it's only like a third or a fourth of its original size now So this is my scrap hide that I've had in my craft bag for four years now or something like that. It's like been my scrap hide for that amount of time. And the reason for that is, I'll show you. So this is actually the grain side. I mean, the, the grain was taken off, obviously, because it's buckskin, but it would have been the grain side. This is the membrane side, which is typically fuzzy. Good. The grain side, like, this hide was just a wreck. Like it's got areas where like um, some of the grain was left on, subgrain, which is not that big of a deal. But like areas that are also like thin and almost, see here's an area that's like got a lot of holes and a ton of grain on there. There's all these little holes that are like thin spots where this hide like rotted a little bit and I think was like halfway done and dried and like molded and rotted. I mean this hide was from god like six years ago probably the skin um, and it just was like not a hide in good shape. It wasn't stored well and I I ended up just and it was you know got troubling holes in it and I tried to sew them all up so it just looks really in person on the grain side it just looks really scrappy and um, had a lot of weak spots in it. So not like a beautiful ideal hide that my perfectionist self would say like, oh, it's perfect buckskin, right? And thank God, see, I didn't even realize it at the time because I hadn't made enough garments yet to truly appreciate the invaluableness of a scrap hide, right? So this hide, you can see it's so small now like the, the two sides, I keep, it keeps shrinking on the sides because this is the hide that I just keep for cutting thong, for cutting thin strips of buckskin to sew all of my other garments, right? Like all, this is literally the glue, the peanut butter and jelly that holds together all the other so-called perfect or wonderful furs and leathers together. It's like what I use to sew fur, furs and other buckskin and sometimes vegetable tan, bark tan leather, um, or cut thick strips um, to braid for bag straps, all those kind of things. Little bags when I just need scraps, when I need scraps for samples for when I'm doing sampling um, different dyes on buckskin so I can make lots of little samples. Like this hide has a million and one uses. And of course I would never want to cut up a so-called perfect, um, perfect buckskin hide to cut it up into scraps, right? That would be heartbreaking. So it's much easier to think, oh, well this is what this hide is meant to be. Like this scrap hide is, is, is not so great maybe if I think of it as a whole garment made out of this but absolutely perfect 
and necessary and beautiful and wonderful um, cut up and all these little bits that are essential essential um, so I just think that's a good lesson you know if there's ever a hide that you're like oh this hide is just like not so great I fucked it up or it's got too many holes in it or it's a buckshot hide so it's like Swiss cheese you know there, there's always something that hide is meant to be and maybe it's just meant to be rawhide, you know, and processed into rawhide. Um, or part of it rawhide and part of it something else. Or, you know, maybe a grain off vegetable tan suede. Like, there are so many different kinds of transformations a hide can go into that maybe aren't, like, the ideal bark tan hide that, like, a craft person would sell. Um, yeah, and I think it makes me sad. It doesn't it just doesn't happen, but it makes me giggle more so when like you know, there's a way I think that natural leather is under pressure to commod to commodifies commoditize. Or I, I have felt that pressure before in my life to like try to commoditize. I'm saying that wrong. My high. It's like, oh if I like maybe I should tan more to sell more so that I can like make a little like more money to live because I always fucking poor as dirt like with my livelihood and teaching um, and I'm just not like it takes me a million and one trillion hours and time and love to do all the hides that I do and all the garments that like there's just no way to me this craft just absolutely refuses to become civilized to become commodified absolutely refuses um, without a price tag on it you know it's like one of my hides is worth a worth a million billion bucks like it's priceless it truly is with a price tag on it it essentially means that I might make 50 cents an hour for my labor you know something like that it's just like truly below slave labor wage um, strange dichotomy there I truly applaud. <laughs> there's there's tanners out there who uh, like tan a lot and sell it, and they must be X Men. Like I just, <laughs> uh, my body could not keep up with that. Uh, but hooray for them! And still, you know, I see what what they sell their hides for, and I know they're worth twice as much, at least. Um, but there's no market, you know, this to to pay for that. Um, and that's because most people in the industrialized world have never made anything from scratch. You know, like try um, either growing or wild harvesting plant fibers yourself. Like flax, growing flax or cotton or harvesting, wild harvesting dog vein or something, or nettles, and processing, processing all the fibers by hand, redding them, combing them, spinning them all by hand weaving them, dyeing them, what it actually takes to make a piece of fabric actually made by hand and not made by, by slavery in some form, whether that's overt human slavery or the enslavement of ecosystems for petroleum extraction. Um, our culture, we just, it's so far from our experience that people have no idea what we'll, what actually goes into the creation of these holy, sacred, completely mundane and normal materials straight from Earth. Straight from Earth. Ah, goodness, goodness, goodness. I also tried something interesting on this bag. <laughs> so I was trying to work on my perfectionism. Um, so I was thinking this winter I was like I just really want to have more because I need so many bags for harvesting and storing of stuff and I I store so many I use cotton pillowcases like old cotton pillowcases I have a bazillion of them and that's what I pack with um, the dried like dried sumac leaves and dried barks um, that I harvest in the summer times and I dry and then I store on mass for winter time to use for tanning um, and that's where I like I store all my like tanned hides. They're packed into cotton bags. So I just need all these like cloth bags. So I just kept thinking like I just need more like simple bags in my life. So what would it be if I like 
made leather bags that weren't like super carefully stitched and perfect, but just kind of like a bag, just like, you know, get the hide out the door. So instead of stitching, first time I tried, this is just a square, it's a simple square rectangle shape. So the hide just folded up in half. And instead of stitching, I braided the edge as an experiment. Isn't that interesting? That's the outside. Here's what it looks like on the inside. <laughs> it's like braiding somebody's hair. Okay, so what I did was just fold the whole hide in half, uh, neck to tail, neck to rump. All right, and then the edges, the two edges on the side, basically cut into thick fringe, basically. And then that fringe uh, just braided like hair. <laughs> it was, still took a little while, um, but it was still faster than stitching, I guess. And you know, to me, like, there's such a, a beauty and an integrity to having the whole hide be in a garment or creation. In our, in our modern world, like, oh, we want, like, a, a pattern, and we, like, cut out shapes for a pattern to then sew together. But most traditional cultures of the world have never done that because they're using hides tanned by hand or fabric woven on a backstrap style loom with uh, edges that all have integrity, no raw edges. You don't want to cut into something like that, not just for practicality, but for the spiritual integrity of that garment. Right? I do think that's part of what fringe was about and is still about here in, here in North America. So you have the whole hide in that garment. And the excess they don't really need, you're cutting into fringe so that it still it adds to the beauty and the mystery of the garment, but also kind of disappears. You know, so you have the integrity of that whole hide in there. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, it kind of worked, except like it was a good experiment. But actually, like the braid has been unraveling a bit on the inside in some parts. So it turned out to not be the strongest solution ever. But it was a good idea. I might try it again in the future in a different way. But actually, the hides, the bag's been working out great. Um, it's super thin, super lightweight. It's good for like when I go harvest greens, like I'm out harvesting like a huge old bag of nettles or, you know, lightweight greens. It's great because I wanted something that like, it's so thin and supple and lightweight that it just like rolls up, you know, like you can just put this, shove this in a bag or a, another bag or a basket and just have like an extra bag to carry with me that folds up really small. So yeah, super great. I just love it when there's little bits of hair that stay on leather. I love that. I love it. On the end, that's why I love using wood ash, because that often happens. If you don't scrape the grain off, if you leave the grain on, you often get little bits of hair stuck to the edges of the hide. Oh, so good. So good. And same with scars. You know, I, sh I could have brought out a large deer hide, grain on. They all have scars. Like, as soon as you take off the hair, you know, you can, you, all of a sudden, you see the map of all the scars over the skin. The map of the life experience of that particular animal. And sadly, it's often long, like, they almost look like claw marks. Long, vertical line scars all the way down the spine, from the neck to the rump, often on deer, especially in rural areas. And it's from the deer, it's from barbed wire. It's from the deer um, sneaking under barbed wire fences. It kind of claws them over the back um, you know, in, far, in pastures and stuff. Just horrifying. Like, God, that's got to be so painful for the deer. And just to see years worth of scars accumulated over years. Um, and tick scars, like little holes or divots in hides that are actually just from tick wounds and tick bites over time stuff like that. Even on little squirrels, I have found little scars. You know, I found a little squirrel take off the, um, the hair. So there's like a little nick scar here, you know, an old little tiny healed scar there. I'm just like, what is the story of these? Like, little guy, did you get in a fight at some point? Did you, like, squirrels very rarely fall. I've only once in my life seen a squirrel fall out of a tree leaping and miss. It's horrifying. 
but you know, I'm just like, what, what is the story of all of these scars that you lived through, none of which seemed life-threatening at all? You know, what is the story of your life? Uh, yeah, so that's all I've got to say. Just a little bit about embracing imperfection. I guess I was thinking about it because I've been scraping like four of these other deer hides this month. I just scraped another one. I scraped the last of the four. Um, bucked, bucked, buck scraped it today. My back fucking hurts so much. So my beam is so tiny and low, it's ridiculous. I have to like do a deep squat <laughs> to like lower my body to the beam. And I'm still like hunched over. It's terrible. The shit, the shit that I do, it's so terrible. So bad on my lower back. Ugh, it's like after that for a day, I'm just like, oh god, look. But that beam is so thin, it's ridiculous to use on deer. But like I try as I might, I know I'm missing subgrain here and there. Um, and I do my best. I still do my best. And thank God that even doing my best, there's going to be imperfection there. Thank God. And that's going to make its way into the garments and um, make their spirit evident and apparent for as long as the life of that garment. And, and thank God. To me, there's almost you know, the way the modern world does it, specifically with real skin that came from real animals. If you've seen some commercial tanned leather, especially chrome tan, stuff like that, it's like a plastic water bottle or something, where it, it looks like it's from another planet. Like it just doesn't seem like anything from this world. And it certainly doesn't seem like anything from an animal. To me, there's almost something a little demonic in that, right? Our, our culture's obsession with perfection or uniformity in turning life into a product and in almost bleaching out the soul from something that was and is inherently living and breathing alive so that we don't have to be reminded every time we see that leather bag or leather shoe that this was an animal that lived and breathed and loved and probably had babies and experienced pain and maybe even had a scary painful death um, with all those emotions inside all of those things the good the bad and the ugly all wrapped together <laughs> human life is the same way you know, it's all the good, the bad, and the ugly. But it's real. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. It's real. It's not plastic. So therefore, it's medicine. The shoes are medicine. The belt is medicine. The bag is medicine. Every time I see it, every time I smell it. How can I not instantly be reminded? How can it not hit my spirit that I'm alive? And this is all real. This isn't, none of this is pretend, pretend, right? Because this animal suffered and died and lived and thrived and lives still. You can't recreate that in, in art, it, yeah, I feel, to a certain degree. I don't think you can recreate that um, in a drawing. Well, some people can. Some people are pretty, pretty magical in that way. I guess for me, that was that was my journey. <laughs> Instead of trying to control little drawings on paper. Um, just to be smeared in the blood and the wood ash and the victories and the pain of being with all these animals after death and life life after death and how that continues to evolve. I was blab. Thanks for listening. That's all for today. The suede bag says says goodbye. Scrap buckskin. Scrap hide says goodbye. It's going to be terrible when I finish, use this up. Hopefully another scrap hide will come into my life. I'm sure it will. Imperfect buckskin says goodbye. Goodbye.